The Signal Oil Company is bringing you The Whistler. Today we will tell you a tale of avarice and greed. The awful price John Hendricks paid for selling his soul to the devil. The story of death demands a payment. But first, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'd like to make a suggestion about your car. Because right now, it's a very valuable possession. One you won't be able to replace until six months or a year after the war. Keeping your present car running is dependent on current lubrication. More so than most people realize. When you leave your car anywhere handy and just say, grease it, you're likely to find later that certain hard-to-find lubrication points have been missed. And in these times, even minor repairs can lay a car up for days. If lubrication fails on parts you can't repair or replace, then you're really out of luck. Doesn't seem worth that much worry, does it? Especially when getting acquainted with a convenient signal dealer can relieve you of it. He knows his stuff, uses the auto manufacturer's own lubrication chart in taking care of your car. In fact, checks every lubrication point twice. You see, he's not just an attendant, but an independent businessman in his community with a genuine interest in keeping his customers' cars in service. I think you'd find it pleasant and profitable to have him count you as one of his regulars. So stop by next week for a really correct lubrication job or anything else on which your signal dealer can help you out. I believe you'll thank me for the tip. And now... against the storm-lashed lightning streak night sky. The state penitentiary. In a cell in this dismal building sit two men. One is John Hendricks, a man of 60, a lifer, sentenced 10 years ago for the murder of his wife and stepson. Murdered Martha and her simple-minded son for the $10,000 she kept hidden in the big house on the outskirts of town. John's cellmate is one Bill Smith, otherwise known as number 1014. Bill has changed in the five years he's been here. He's decided to go straight, if he ever gets out. Bill Smith started reading here, reading philosophy and so forth. Bill Smith has changed. But John Hendricks hasn't changed. Not Hendricks, because he has a plan he has a clever plan in mind. Well, all I got to say, Bill, is that I think you're crazy enough to make the trial with me. It's a matter of opinion, Henry. It's all fixed. Not a chance of a slip up. Yeah. Don't tell me you got the break fixed with the warden. What difference does it make who it is, so long as the whole thing is set? Henry, I think you're nuts. They're crazy. Yeah. When I'm getting out of this place, I got a reason, a good reason. I got something waiting for me outside. Something that belongs to me. I'm the only one that knows where it is. And I'm getting out of here. You're in here for a long time, Bill. If you don't want to make a try with me, you can stay and rot. Suppose you do find this money hidden away in the old lady just there. What good did you? You killed her and her stepson to get it, didn't you? I did not. I didn't kill anybody. I say you did. That ain't true. But I know where the money is. Okay. You can break out. You can have the money. But, well, I've done a lot of thinking and reading since I've been here. Yeah. You've gone soft. Maybe so. But this much I do know. If I ever do get out, I'll do things differently. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, you just got religion. I get exactly what's coming to me. And believe me, and so will you. If you break out, they'll have your back one way or another. Watch and see. Well, I'm going, so you watch and see. Just watch. <laughs> Another storm. A lonely country road. A car. The southern part of the state. 
to that village we passed a few miles back. That silent, sleeping village was Marsdensburg. And that small stone building was the county courthouse. The courthouse where John Hendricks was tried and convicted for the murder of his wife and her simple-minded son, Henry. We're on the outskirts of town now. A young man is driving the old car, and there's a girl beside him. Motor trouble? Ah, just ahead of light. Yes. It's a little crossroad store. There's a light inside, George, but I don't see anybody. It's close. We'd better drive on. Yeah. I guess you're right, John. Uh, evening, folks. There's trouble. Well, uh, we're having motor trouble. That's all. Uh, what are you doing driving around on a night like this? Huh? Uh, we're on our way west. Oh, mister, is there an inn or something around here where we can stay for the night? Inn? Well, uh, there's a place about eight miles up the road. They'll probably put you up. Sign on the left-hand side of the road. You can't miss it. It road's pretty bad, though, and rain. Gotta be careful. You'll find yourself walking. Well, thank you. We'll try it. Uh, Good night. Good luck, mister. You will need the luck. The storm is increasing now. The little car lurches and bounces in its bite to keep the center of the highway. Two miles. Three miles. Four, maybe five, and look, there it is, straight ahead. On the right side of the road, a blue light. That's it. Wait, George. Did the old man say on the right side or the left side of the road? Oh, George, what's wrong? Oh, I don't know. The distributor must have gotten wet. George? What? The blue light is gone. It's gone. Where is it? Oh. We must have passed it. Oh, we couldn't have. I was looking right at it. It seems as though it, it just disappeared into some air. Well, I'd better turn in here. This motor won't last much longer. Why, well, I guess so. I I can't see a thing, can you? Oh, it's certainly a desolate looking place. There, there must be a house back in there. Oh, oh there it is. There's the driveway, 20 feet ahead. Yeah. Well, this motor's about to conk out. we better drive in and see what we can find. Yes. Drive in, George. You'll find something. That's right. Through the gate. Make the curve. Hurry. There goes your motor. A little more. Now. Oh, we just made it. Thank heaven. Yes. That's right. Always thank heaven at a time like this. All right. Get out and go up on the porch. Let me help you, John. Well, I'm all right. What do we do with the bag? We'll leave them here until we find out if there's anyone here. Come on. Do you see a bell? No. I can't see a thing. Gee, this place looks completely deserted. I don't think anyone lives here. I don't either. Oh, let's go. Where do I get my flashlight? Yeah. No, there's no bell that I can see. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is deserted. Then why should they have a light on the road staying lodging? That is strange, isn't it? But I wonder why it went out just as we wished it. I wonder. Oh, George, let's don't knock. I don't like this place. Let's go on. How? With a dead motor? Where could we go? No. I'll knock. Well, all right. Ah, that's right. Knock, George. Knock. Go ahead. Louder. Again. We've just got to have shelter. Yes, we, we can't stay in that car any longer. Can we? No. Wait, not. Here it comes. Now you're on your own, George. On your own. There is someone. Oh. Oh. Uh, uh, good evening. What is it? Well, um, uh, our car. Uh, yes, our, 
I can't afford them. We can't go any farther in such a terrible night out that we thought we could stop here for the evening. Stop here? Why, yes, we we saw your light. And... Light? What light? Well, the blue neon out in front. There is no light. Have you a room? Yes, there is a room. Well, uh, could we come in? I mean, what? It's awfully wet out here. You may come in. If you wish. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's quite a relief. We were afraid you'd closed up for the night. Especially when all the lights were out. All the lights out? Yes, you see. Huh? Of course the lights are out. Oh, I didn't know. You, you do take tourists. Do we? Well, yes, that's, that's what they told us. Who told you? Well, the man. The old man at the little store back at the crossroad told us. Little store? Yes, at the crossroad about five miles back. You, you know where the crossroad is. There is no store at the crossroad. There isn't? No. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, uh, look, madam... Would you mind turning on the lights? I can't see a thing. We have no light here. No? No light? Uh, give me a flashlight, Joan. She means uh, there's no electricity here. No, there is no light here. Throw the flash around. There must be a lamp. No, don't make a light. We see well in the dark. We? Who's we? Is there someone else in the house? My son. Oh, oh, well, he's gone to bed. He's standing beside you. Beside who? You. Son. Yes, mother. Oh. Uh, give, give me that flash. You got it. You got it. Uh, oh, yeah. Where do you live? How long have you been standing here, brother? <laughs> Since you came in. Is that so? <laughs> well, I didn't see you. You make a noise like a spook. Who are you? What is your name? It's George Kimball. This is my wife, Joan. We're on our way west with travelers. Travelers? Oh, really? What? Quiet, son, quiet. Uh, no, 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 let him talk. He's quiet enough. Uh, how, how long have you folks been living here? We've lived here all our lives. Say, uh, uh, how about closing the door? Is the door open? <laughs> of course it is. What? Oh, uh, take it easy, John. Don't get excited. Uh, look, madam, uh, there's a candle on that table over there by the fireplace. Yes, uh, Yes, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to light it. Please, don't. Uh, wait a minute. If you want us to stay here, I insist that we have some light. You you do want us to stay here, then. Do we? Do we, son? <laughs> yes, mother. What? What are you looking at me for? Yes, mother. Without lies. Yes, Mary. <laughs> oh, God, let's go. I don't want to stay here tonight. This place doesn't look good to me. There has been no good here for many years. See what I mean, George? Well, I don't get it. You don't seem to want us, and it's your son does. Well, how do you make any money that way? We don't make money. You don't? You mean you haven't had any guests lately? No. Not for many years. Well can't expect any if you act like this. But we do expect a guest. Don't we, son? <laughs> yes, Mother. <laughs> you certainly have a surprise coming. Yes, we have. Uh, how many rooms have you? There are many rooms, but only one. Only one? Oh, now that doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Only one for guests. Well, you mean only one equipped? Yes. Yeah. Well, then, if you've got a reserve for this guest you expect, what are we going to do? There is an inn farther along the road. They have rooms. They will take you. It will be best. Ah, uh, That's what I distributed. They got wet, so the car won't even run. Where is your car? It's right there at the foot of the steps. I see no car. You do? Why, it's standing right there. George. George. Oh, Oh, it is gone. Where and how? I didn't hear a sound. Oh, they must have rolled ahead. Throw your light around. It's not a sound. Say, 
What goes on here? Time, yes, mother. You moved the car. Yes, mother. Why? Jim. I understand, son. I understand. Now, now, wait a minute. Your son moved it? Well, how could he? The motor won't run and he would. Oh, we didn't hear sound. No sound. How'd you move it? I don't know. That's a fine thing. Here we are in a place where they don't want us and no way of leaving. Well, well, you've got us on your hands now. You have to make the best of it. Oh, no, George. We'll leave. Oh, no. This is all silly. Now, come on. Let's have some light and cut the monkey business. Well, son, what have we decided? Yes, mother. We've decided. <laughs> yes. Very well, if you wish. If you wish, you may stay. Stay until... Until when? All night? <laughs> yes, mother. And if you wish... Well, that's better. Now, that's more like it. Now, I like this camp. There we are. George. Look. Well, I'll be. Look at that dust and the cobweb. This place looks deserted. It looks like an old cellar. Well, uh, how about the room? Uh, do we get it or the guest you expect? There is another room that will do, perhaps. Well, could we see it? Uh-huh. By the way, uh, how much do you charge? We charge nothing. You, you charge nothing? Nothing. <laughs> Sounds silly, but it's a break for us. We're running short anyway. Uh, let's see the room. Very well. It is upstairs. Uh, after you, ma'am. No, you go first. Very well. Come on, John. Bring out of the camp. Come, son. Follow me. Yes, I <laughs> I never saw so much dust. They must like it, you know. Nice, clean dust. That room at the head of the stairs. Why, this room's well furnished. Is uh, this the room reserved for your expected guest? No. But you said you only had one room furnished. Uh, who sleeps here? This is my room. Was your room? I stay here now. Oh, I see. Uh, or do I? Well, it's a nice soft bed. It was always comfortable. We leave you now. Come, son. We must leave them alone now. Yes, sir. Leave them alone. Good night. Good night. You will lock your door. Huh? Oh. Oh, yes. We'll lock it. <laughs> Goodbye. Did she say good night? Or goodbye? I don't know. I, I thought she said... She did say goodbye. Oh, what a screwy outfit. Oh, boy, I wish we hadn't had car trouble. Oh, that's what we get for trying to drive in the rain. How much money have we left? Oh, not very much. Just enough to get to Los Angeles. That's the way I figure. But once we get there, I know there'll be a job for me. Oh, we'll make it. Don't you worry. You'll see me in a nice job in Hollywood. I'm not worried about seeing you in Hollywood. No? No. I'm just worried about seeing you in, in the morning. The same night, but later. It's midnight. Another car on the same road. You know who it is. It's John Hendricks. And you know where he's going. He turns in at our deserted mansion, up the driveway, and stops. He steps out, lifts up the step, opens the door, and throws his flash about the dusty room. The cobwebs glisten in the beam. A few moments, and the light comes to rest on the fireplace. He steps quickly to the mantel, draws a small hammer and a chisel from his pocket, and set to work, removing a brick. Now he's finished. The brick is loose. He reaches in and withdraws a heavy yellow envelope. He starts to put it in his pocket, but suddenly freezes it in his tracks. He can't move. He turns icy cold. Turn around, Hendrick. Turn around. Look. At the foot of the stairs across the room... 
stands a woman holding a candle. And beside her, a grinning youth holding an axe. Turn around, Hendrick. Look at their heads covered with blood. Turn around. John Hendrick. Murderer. John Hendrick. Martha. Yes, John. Hendrick. Yes, John. No. No. We'll come for you, John. The same way you came for us. No. No. We're waiting for you, John. Here you come back for the money. No, I've been waiting. We've come to pay the bill. No, 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 please don't come near me, please. You must suffer, John. I've suffered. I've suffered. Not enough, John. Not enough. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't plan to kill you. I went mad. I lost my head. No, 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 no. Don't come near me. You can have the money. You can have the money. Then give it no, to us, John. Please don't come near me. Give us the money. No, please. You can have the money. Now. Come, son. You no. must have the money and we'll take you. No. Come, no, no, no. Come. Have the money on the floor. No, no, please. Not please. 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 Oh, please. Oh, please. 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 I don't see a thing. Here. Here's a flashlight. Yeah. Great Scott. Look. A man down there on the floor. Come on. He's dead. Look at the gun. It's been fired, but I don't see a mark on him. Oh, let's get out of here. Oh, I'll say. Come on. No, you don't. Stand where you are. George. Come. What's going on here? Hand over that gun. What are you doing here? Oh, we're, we're stopping here. The, the bodies were just leaving. I can see that. You know this man on the floor? No. But yes, yes. Joan, what's the matter with you? Oh, no, no. We don't know him. Take a look at him, Frank. Yes, sir. What are you two doing here? Well, we're, we're, we're guests. Yes, we're, we're both guests. Yes? Who's guests? Well, I guess the lodge is tourists. Guests of the old lady. What old lady? The old lady who lives here. The old lady and her, and her son. <laughs> Well, you'll have to cook up a better one than that. What do you mean? Drive here? Where's your car? Why, uh, the sun took it. Sun? Old lady? What are you talking about? They live here. They said they owned this place. We we had motor trouble and they put us up for the night. What about him, Frank? He isn't dead. Breathing. Looks like he had a stroke or something. Hmm. Him, all right. John Hendricks. Take a look around and see if there's anyone else there. Yes, sir. You. What's your name? George Kimball. This is my wife. We're on our way to California. Do you know who this man is? Certainly. We've been on his trail. He's an escaped convict. This your gun? No, sir. Did he shoot at you? No, sir. Well, this gun's been fired. We heard shots as we turned in the driveway. Ah. Look at the bullet hole near the ceiling. Hendricks probably missed whoever he shot at because of the choke. Oh, Frank, what'd you find? Not a sight of anyone, sir. Nothing but dust and cobwebs. Oh. <clears throat> Look, Kimball. You said there was an old lady and her son here. Why, sure. They were here all evening. They're not here now. Well, they, they let us in and showed us to our room. They certainly were here. What, uh, what did the old lady look like? Well, she had gray hair and wore a kind of a house dress and an apron. Hmm. What did the boy look like? Oh, he was a big kid. I'd say about 20. had a round, rosy face, and I think... In fact, I know he was kind of simple-minded. He had a strange laugh. Oh, yes, and he had red hair. Well, I'll be good. What do you think of that, Frank? Golly, gives me the creeps. Why so? Do you know who you just described? No. The old lady and her son who used to live here. Used to live here? Yes, they were murdered here ten years ago. What? Murdered? Sure, sure. This man on the floor was her husband. The boy stepped on it. He was tried for killing them with a knife and stealing her money in bonds. He got off with second degree because of lack of evidence. He escaped a week ago and headed this way. We've been on his trail ever since he entered this county. So you see, Kimball, if there was anybody else here tonight, it must have been a figment of your imagination. This house has been deserted for ten years. Oh, oh, George. Good Lord. Look, Sergeant, mm. I found this envelope on the dining room floor there. Well, what do you know? The bond. Old Martha Hendricks' bond. That's why Hendricks came here. 
Yeah, I'll look around. We'll probably find the money, too. But, but where did they go? Where the old lady? No place. Because they weren't here, Kimball. Well, <clears throat> we better get them out of there and back to headquarters. Hey, wait a minute. Don't leave her. Well, you won't. You're coming along, too. Why? We'll need you for a day or two. Well, let's get going, Frank. Come on. But, but where did they go? We saw them. We know they were here. Well, you certainly described them to a T, but... Oh, don't worry too much about it. You know, things like this can drag your neck. You know what I mean. Things like this... Well, things like this sometimes just... Just happen. You know what I mean? No. Well... Oh, come on, come on. Let's go before I get the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> Whistler will finish his strange tale in just a moment. While we're waiting for his explanation, here's an interesting state, a statement from a military expert about the gasoline we're all doing without. If you've been to several gas stations and found them out, you'll appreciate it. This military authority says, quote, We're fighting a war of engines. The side which keeps the most tanks and trucks rolling, the most planes flying, will win. This takes many more engines than we had to keep running in peacetime. And some of these military motors burn a gallon of gas a minute. The oil industry's job is to keep the fuel tanks of these engines full. It's a tremendous job. Oil men are doing everything they can to increase production. But over 53% of all the gasoline produced must now go into military use. Unquote. The Signal Oil Company brings you these facts so that when your signal dealer can't fill her up as he used to, you can better appreciate how the gallons you're doing without or helping carry us down the road to victory. Another way by which America's unequal resources are winning this war. Now, the whistler. What was it the officer said? Things like this just sometimes happen. Just happen? Well, sometimes they do and can't always be explained. <laughs> But not this time. Oh, no. Not this time. This can be explained. Remember John Hendricks' cellmate, Bill? Bill Smith, number 1014? He can explain. He knows all about it because he planned it. Yes. He had learned all the dope from Hendricks, and he sent his pal, the phony Fuchs, to get the money when Hendricks recovered it. You see, he didn't want to hurt John. He wanted to scare him out of it. Remember? Bill, 1014, said he had changed. He said he'd never do things the way he'd done them before. And he didn't. But he hadn't changed. I know. <laughs> Next week, same time, I, the Whistler, will return to tell you... Another unusual story. Good night. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler... Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Bill Connell speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.